So here it is, May 2nd, 2021. Happy May, everybody. Welcome to, you know, May flowers. You know, May is a neat month with that. Mother's Day is in May. So, you know, for, for our moms and our influencers in our life, we've got moms here with Roz and Jacqueline and Maureen and iPad 5. If you're a mom, welcome. Um, but, you know, so next week's episode is really going to be inspired by what are some of mom's favorite things to have on Mother's Day. We already know one ingredient that's going to be next week. What's it going to be, mom? Lobster. Lobster, to repeat that. Very Atlantic Canadian, very in season. We're going to talk a little bit about eating in season. And um, so this is lobster season. So here on the Funday Coast. So very exciting timeline. You will see much more seafood and it's readily abundant. And we will be going down to the docks and we'll be working with Colin Seafood, who's going to be bringing us some treats. So what will we make with the lobster? Yet to be determined. But we're here to talk about honey. Well, honey at Atlantic Canada cooks, well, as I can tell you this, there is honey all over Atlantic Canada and it is extremely readily available. It's made by local producers. It's made by small batch producers, which is a very exciting thing. It's individuals that do, you know, maybe they sell only 100 or 200 bottles of a certain thing. Many people produce it just to enjoy with their families. Uh, we're going to talk today about some uses of honey and not just in your food. Because do you know what? It's one of the sweetest substances in the world. And, and, and known to man, it's one of the oldest substances that we know from a nutritional standpoint. When we opened up the, the, you know, the, the tombs in Egypt and different things went in, there's vats of honey that were found. My grandfather took what every day? Mom? Oh, two tablespoons. Anyway. Two tablespoons of honey every day my grandfather did. And he also, as he got older, took some bee pollen pills. And that was something that was very exciting to him because there's tremendous health benefits that a couple of the team are going to talk about today. But we're, let's talk about how sweet and yummy it is. And in recipes, it's often and in highly recommended, especially from a health standpoint, to use as a great healthy substitute in place of refined sugar. The difference is, is you don't always use it in an equal measurement. And here's a funny tip. Once you get over a cup, anything under a cup, it's almost measure for measure. But our beekeeper that I met with Ron yesterday had really talked about the sweetness difference. And if you're using a liquid, you would use a little bit less of the sweetener and just remember to also adjust your liquid in your recipe. So if you're going to substitute honey, go online and get some extra advice. And I'm sure Jacqueline knows how to do that a little bit more. But I didn't use recipes that I had to worry about ratios today. We just used several types of honey with the, with the different pieces of what it is. So mom's getting a call in the middle of the show, which is great. She knows she can hit a button on the sign to ignore it. But so this is raw honey. And I want to tell you, see this bucket? I literally buy it in a bucket this size, which is pretty exciting in and of itself. Um, I go through it. So this honey, as you can see, I can tip it upside down and it's not going to go anywhere. And you can see where the spoon has been digging it out. So in several of the recipes today, I'm using this raw organic honey. Um, it's lovely. It's great. I really take it and lick it off a spoon sometimes, to be honest with you. But so I'm going to use that type of honey. We're also going to be looking at a regular honey. This is a particular one. It is done in Nova Scotia. And in Dubert, Nova Scotia, and um, it's a Killison's honey. So it is a wildflower, and you're going to see a lot of product in Nova Scotia in and around Lunenburg and where the school is. It's extremely plentiful, and we love it because the bees are very happy in and around. And we're going to talk a little bit. I think Richard might have a, a picture, and if he was able to download the video, if not, I did post it on Cooking Club on Facebook because I spoke with Ron, the beekeeper, yesterday. And he was telling us as to what is happening. So um, very interesting. Mom and I decided that we're gonna foster a beehive this year. So we're very excited about what that looks like. So um, Angela McDougall at Funday Farms Fresh Local Harvest down the way have wonderful beehives, but they've gotten a little too big and they need to split them up and they need another home. Now I won't be the one, we might feed them a little bit, 
but the beekeeper will come down and take care of them. So trust me, the bees will be in good hands. Maybe we'll get a bottle of honey out of the end of it. That's, we're not worried about that. So they're gonna be coming down. So we're gonna have some updates. That'll be produced in July here in Atlantic Canada is a lot, you'll see honey producing more and more. So one tip though here in Atlantic Canada is in July, keep your white clover on your yard. So that's the key month here in Atlantic Canada, not mow your lawn because we don't get as much rain, which means there's not as many flowers. So we do want those clovers and those things to keep the bees going. Lots of people in May are gonna not mow their lawns. It's great for the butterflies and the bees, but it is much more because all the flowers are blooming. So we've got pretty happy bees right now. So we're excited to share a little bit more bee tips and some bees wax things. I'm gonna leave that to Rosalind. I'm gonna share one interesting thing. Um, see, this is a wood finish. They have beautiful little bees on it. Do you know what this is? It's a beeswax that's made into a wood finish that you would put over wooden cutting boards, chartreuterie boards, that type of thing to keep them healthy and to keep those natural wood sealed. So there's one, and I know Jacqueline's smiling. She was very curious about how we use beeswax. So I'm gonna run through our menu and then I'm actually gonna get one Greek recipe going and we're gonna go over and we're gonna listen to see what we've got Jacqueline's got going because she started us off with a wonderful drink. And I'm very excited to make that drink with honey. So let's talk about recipes. So I'm doing a pan seared scallop, which is again, is one of our favorite treats here in Atlantic Canada this time of year. And it's gonna go in a bed of a carrot, honey and parsnip puree, which I can tell you, we'll show you the things. This beautiful puree is sitting here in the bowl. Look how whipped up that stays. And that's a lovely recipe. And we're gonna have a seared scallop on top of that. And with a honey drizzle, and guess what? Some edible flowers to top off how beautiful that's gonna look. So we're pretty excited to have that. So we're gonna get those seared up, Jacqueline, while you're doing a bit more of your thing. There's those beautiful scallops. Hopefully everybody can see those. We're doing a little tree because we had pre-breakfast. So this is our scallop snack morning. Mom and I are excited about that. Um, we're gonna talk about the carrot puree and I've got a wonderful, maple honey mustard marinade that I made. And um, we've got the recipe I'm gonna share after, but this is the chicken that we did. You see how beautiful that glaze comes out? Yes, I know, right? The honey gives it that beautiful shine. I'm sure Roz, when you guys own the restaurant, you probably popped honey in a few things to make them look really pretty too. So um, we're gonna talk a little bit about more of that recipe. Richard's doing another thing, a roasted chicken with a honey glaze. We're excited to see that from Ireland. Jacqueline's got a fabulous Vietnamese honey uh, milk drink that I'm excited about. Bread and honey from Liverpool, Nova Scotia for Maureen, because you know, here in Atlantic Canada, bread and honey is a very common thing. And then Rosalind's gonna talk a bit about baklava. And, and she's also gonna really give us some tips because she uses the beeswax in a few things in a few different ways. So I think I've covered everything off on our amazing menu. So I, like I said, I'm gonna start off by telling you what went into my carrot puree and then Jacqueline, we're gonna go over to you because it's all done. So this might be one of the simplest recipes that I've made in a while. I do love purees. And if anybody realizes puree really is Kind of feels a bit like baby food sometimes, I'm not gonna lie. But it's a beautiful, thick, luxurious, and usually a vegetable that you've taken and you're putting it on the side to use as an accompaniment, maybe not as a full piece with whatever delicate or fish or whatever item you're serving. So this one is, I would say, now you've got this amount out of it. So this would be lovely for a dinner for four to have that enough puree to give to everybody or if you're using it as a bit more decorative on a plate. So I'm gonna give the exact measurements of this, but I used one can of coconut milk. Mom just happened to be getting this particular one at Costco, but it's a can of whole coconut milk, and this is an organic premium one that we used. So in a pot, coconut milk, I did one and one quarter cup of chopped carrots. So cup 
and a quarter chopped carrots. Okay, chop them up fairly small so they fit into the measuring cup you want. If anything, throw an extra carrot in, trust me. And then a parsnip. So we'll look around for a new way. Jacqueline, do you know what a parsnip is? Do you guys have parsnips? Kind of looks like a white carrot, doesn't it? It's not, it's another root vegetable. They grow fairly big like this, most of them, unless you pick them early. And they've got a little bit more of an earthy flavor to it. They're not as sweet as a carrot. They're actually a little bit more, I'm gonna say not bitter, but earthy flavor. And a little bit like a rutabaga or um, a little bit turnipy family. So they grow underground. They sprout up like sprouts like a carrot. And there you go. So I took one of these and, and it equated to about three quarters of a cup. So the whole two cups of cut up carrot and parsnip or just carrot, it would be fine. I of course put, everybody can smell it, some fresh thyme. I did about a tablespoon of fresh thyme. Then I took some minced onion. So I've got it, oh, I had it, there we go. So I get the dried onion from Angela at Urban Joy. She said the organic dried onion. And if not, you can probably get it. So it's pure onion. So it has one tablespoon of that in it. And then of course, what did it have in it? It's got organic honey. So here's what we're gonna do. Cook all of that in the pot, no honey, until everything is exactly where you want it to be, okay? So your carrots are cooked, your parsnips are cooked. So you've got your liquid, your honey is reserved off to the side, get it all cooked down, and then blend it up with an immersion blender. Once it's all blended and then it's beautiful, stir in a quarter of a cup of honey at the end. And the key that you don't wanna cook the honey with it, because it will actually cook some of the flavor of the honey out when you're boiling into the coconut milk. So, quarter of a cup of honey at the end of it. And again, I use the organic honey because it's being put into hot liquid and it gave it a beautiful like, piece. So there is your honey, carrot, parsnip, coconut puree. Fantastic, completely dairy free. We know everybody wants a bite of it. So I think mom's starting the scallops, but Jacqueline, while we're gonna get those ready to sear, we're gonna put it over to you to share our wonderful drink. Okay, thank you, Michelle. I'm ready. Um, before we get started, uh, I'd like to share with you some information about honey. Why we should use more honey. Um, as you can see here, honey treats a host of health problems like insomnia, indigestion, coughs uh, in Vietnam. People, uh, rem honey is a, a good remedy for cough, mm, or colds, headaches, fatigue, and so on. And um, honey enhances immunity. Uh, it boosts your metabolism, uh, controls blood sugar, uh, nourishes your skin. Yeah, in Vietnam, women like to use uh, honey uh, for their skin, skin care. And um, today I'd like to share with you uh, a kind of um, drink. In Vietnam, we say Sung Sao Mak Ong. And uh, I, I, uh, I translated into English like uh, Vietnamese black grass jelly with honey, coconut milk, and milk. And this is the favorite summer drink in Vietnam, especially uh, in these hot days. Uh, now, let's start with the ingredients. Um, we need the black grass jelly powder, uh, 50 grams, water, one liter of water. Uh, I use palm sugar, but this is optional. Mm, you can use sugar or not, it's up to you. Uh, cold milk. Uh, uh, you see the, the name of the milk here, Dalak milk. And uh, I am proud of my uh, country, uh, my, my, uh, my hometown. 
the Highland Dala, and it is one of the the, the best milk in Vietnam. Uh, we need some coconut milk and honey. You can replace honey by uh, maple syrup or sugar. Now let's move on to uh, how to make uh, the black uh, grass jelly. First of all, you mix 50 gram of black grass jelly powder with 200 millimeters of water and sugar. You have to stir the mixture until completely dissolved. And after that, you boil 800 millimeters of water in a pan. Pour the jelly mixture into the boiling water. Stir the mixture constantly until the mixture completely dissolved. That means you have to cook for about three minutes. And then pour the hot solution into a container to cool off. After that, refrigerate it for at least two hours before serving. And it is uh, how to make the jelly. And uh, after about two hours storing the jelly in the refrigerator, uh, you can serve it. Cut the jelly into small cubes and put them into a container. Add coconut milk, cold milk, and honey. And then it's ready to enjoy. And my sons love this drink very, very much. It is delicious. Okay, it is very simple. But uh, I don't know for sure if you can find uh, black grass jelly in Canada or not. Michelle, do you find uh, this kind of jelly in Canada? Do you know what? I'm not sure on that one. I did do a slight sleuthing, but I'm telling you, I didn't make as far. But I'm going to do some looking this week. I'm going to, I don't know if Roz might be able to answer that. It, that might be a little bit, like, what's the base of the jelly made from? Oh. Uh, Okay, let me stop. Okay, let me stop the share here. That looks beautiful though, Jacqueline, I love. Yeah, uh, this is the kind of powder that I uh, I buy at the supermarket. And uh, the, the ingredients are black grass jelly and uh, starch. But I don't know for sure that you can find it in Canada or not. In well, Vietnam, what? it is popular. Uh, Jacqueline, Emily just said that it's in Toronto, in the Asian, so we can get it in Canada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in Vietnam, it is very popular. People love uh, to eat it. And uh, it is said that it is good uh, for our health. Yeah. Well, listen, we know that you are always going to bring us the best tips from Vietnam that are great yeah. for our health. We look forward to every week to that tip. For so we're going to go looking for that this week. Emily, thank you for sharing that point. We're going to put that on our shopping list to see exactly how we bring that one around. Okay. Thank you. So Jacqueline, is okay, there anything else? You. Yeah, I was going to say, is there anything else that you want to add with that one? So are we ready to have a pan seared scallop? Because I know I am. So I'll tell you right after, right after I get this one done and this demonstration done, you know, we're gonna, I think we're gonna roll over to Richard to see what he's got prepared for his chicken dish so that mom and I can take a moment and have our scallop. So I must say, Helen did a great job of getting those cooked perfectly. If there's one thing when you're a good East Coaster, you learn how to make sure to sear a scallop properly. So if you guys can see that, I'm gonna get it turned around this way. Rosalind and get a nod up from a feather scallop lever. So there's the beautiful puree that's on the bottom and you see, and be careful, it's not gonna roll off. So what I have done with this is I have made our beautiful honey glaze. So in this honey, I'm gonna put it down for a minute. I used a clear honey because I'm gonna make this into a drizzle. So I wanted to make sure that the honey was clear. So what I have done here and with the honey, and you can see where it's gonna end up just a nice drizzle. You see that? 
right? It's beautiful. So what I've taken is I've taken the Italian seasoning that Angela does, and I just put a little bit of that into the honey because all it does is it gives it a little bit of that different flavor. So you can see that again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drizzle that just a little bit, and I'm going to hold it up high because I don't want a giant chunk of that on the scallop. But all it's going to do, there we go, is like we say to sometimes say is just kiss the top of the scallop. So you see, and it's got a little bit of that herb in there. And because you know what, we eat with our eyes before anything, we're going to top that off with some beautiful edible flowers. So, wow. So there's the carrot honey puree with a beautiful Bay of Funday seared scallop topped off with a tiny bit of the honey glaze. Because in all honesty, as good scallop eaters and seafood lovers here in Atlantic Canada, we often don't put a lot of flavor around it. We might have something with it, right, Roz? But then we really just want to eat that seafood on top of it. And a scallop has a very beautiful sweetness to it. And I find these lighter flavors really bring that out. So from our kitchen to yours, we're going to have a snack on this one. So Richard, how about we zoom over to Ireland and see what's going on with your chicken dish? Okay, well, let's see. The chicken is more or less roasted, and I'm making the um, the honey glaze right now. So it's just about ready. I've added. Um, it's kind of similar to the other one that was made of. I've had. I put mustard in it. This is. Uh, it's not fancy mustard. It's just. It's just Heinz. Uh, French's kind of French's kind of stuff. It's full of sugar, but you know, whatever. Um, and I'm making it with lemon, so fresh lemon. So I'm adding that a little bit in here and and orange juice. So a little bit of orange juice as well. So it's gonna be orange honey mustard sauce for chicken. And here's the honey. Now I've added a little bit in, um, but as to what Michelle just said, she was saying, you know, to wait till the end so that the flavor doesn't get boiled out. So it's just about, it's boiling at the moment. I'll just show you here. <laughs> So you so can Richard, I'm going to add yours. Keep keep that up there. Don't put that away. Bring it right back. In my particular application is different. So Richard, each time you're going to use honey in a particular one, you're putting yours into your glaze in that way. So you would want to cook that through. So that looks fantastic, by the way. All right. Well, I have had it a bit, so I'm so I'm adding a bit more. Now this is um. You know, it's from Kilkenny, as I said before, raw and unblended pure honey, but it's um, it's very liquidy, so I don't need a spoon for it or anything. It'll just pour right in. So, which makes me wonder uh, what's the difference with the raw honey for Michelle's, which is, you know, hard and... Keep doing like that. Richard, I'll tell you what the difference is, is there's probably about 30 to 40 different types of application and how you can use honey and also come in the honey yeah. comb. The difference is um, when the beekeeper and whoever has done the honey, it depends on how much honey that bee has produced and when they're harvesting it. So, um, and also sometimes after honey sat for a while, but if you've had any type of processing that's been done to the honey, that's when you're gonna see the clearer and the clearer and the clearer honey. Normally you're gonna see some of those ones that have been processed a bit more. Not that there's anything wrong with some of that processing, because I'm gonna say that some of it is fine, takes the air and purities and different things out of it. But I know Roz will talk a little bit too about some honey stuff. We actually know a little bit about honey around here. Well, that's good, that's good. Well, it says raw and unblended, so I thought it would be, you know, the best one anyway. So what I'll do now is this is, uh, this is nice and boiling and all together. So I'll take out the chicken, da -da -da, which is a free range bird that I put on about an hour ago. And I've already drained the, um, the sauce, the, uh, the, well, the, you know, the, the gravy on the bottom and put it in the dog dish along with the skin. <laughs> so, so what's going to be left here now is the honey will go into these slits, which I've cut here. So they, they go into there. Now I, this is my, this is my saucepan here. It's a wok. I, I don't think there's anything a wok can't do. So here we go. <laughs> and then whatever's, whatever does get down to the bottom of the chicken, it's going to be the sauce that I eat it with. 
So that's, you know, like the dipping sauce, which I'll just put in a little dish. It's kind of boiling already, which is, which is interesting. Um, so back into the oven. I'm going to glaze that in onto the top, and then that should be ready to eat by the end of the show. Yeah. So sorry about the, uh, yeah, yeah. Now I have um, a little bit of a PowerPoint here. Should we put that up now? So Richard, no, we're going to keep focused on your recipe because, and I just want to maybe ask you, Jacqueline's got a few more that went through a bit of the health benefit pieces of it. So if you're still waiting for your recipe to finish, we've got a few more recipes that we need to get to. So maybe we'll zoom back over and you can do a little bit of that once we catch up with Rosalind and what's cooking in her kitchen. How's that sound? Good, because we have pictures of Michelle's hives. That doesn't we sound do. right. <laughs> we do, but let's, let's roll over and we're gonna come back around. We got half an hour in, a couple more recipes to go, but let's come back and look at the, the hives that are gonna be coming from our... <laughs> fostering of a beehive. Who knew that was a thing? So, and I know Rosalind's already backing up if there's an extra beehive evil to mm -hmm. The beautiful um, thing is about, understand where we both live. We both live with rural backyards. There would be a lot of things that in a lot of a residential area you would not be able to do this, um, depending on where it is and they can't be disturbed. Both of us are beautiful, fortunate backyards that don't have it where they won't be disturbed by humans and people on a regular basis, nor a lawnmower. So I said, it was a really good idea in Atlanta, Canada, if I had another excuse to not to mow my lawn. But Roz, let's roll it over to you and let's talk about that beautiful, and is it the, is it the baklava that we discussed yesterday? Um, actually, she was out, so I had to go to another client uh, that's a good friend of mine and I ended up picking it up there. So, it so tell us well. about who you picked it up from and where you picked it up and what you've got with the baklava. So um, I'm not cooking today. I ended up uh, going to a uh, person that made the baklava. So baklava is from the Middle East area and it's, it has uh, different layers of phyllo pastry and it's delicious. It has a nuts on the bottom and it's, uh, it's one of those things that it's, it's uh, not hard to make but it just takes a fair amount of time. And I just thought, you know what? what better recipe than uh, baklava because it's made with honey and nuts and phyllo pastry. Um, this particular one, uh, as you can tell, the, the pastry is very thin, it's paper thin, and it's layers and layers of it. And it's, uh, it's made with a, with a honey syrup and with lots of nuts in the middle. So I'm gonna love to eat that this, the, tonight with my meal. But I want to talk to you about the beeswax portion. So what I have done in the past is I've made my own beeswax, but you can also purchase uh, pieces of uh, fabric that have beeswax. And what, ha what you do with this beeswax is you wrap your cheese in it, you um, put it over a dish. I'll show you how it's to save. Um, so you just, uh, it's full of wax beeswax and you just put it over the dish and it, you heat it up with your hands to seal the dish. So in order to, I've made it numerous ways. The, the, easy, the best way towards the end, I've tried it, I don't know, probably four different ways of, of doing it. So you uh, have to grade the wax. It comes in a pound at a, at, from the bee harvester and you grate it like you would cheese. And that gives you a very fine uh, uh, wax. Now you can purchase it so it's already grated. So you don't have to take the time to grate it if you wish. It's a better, um, um, more economic oh, if you buy it by the pound and grate it yourself. So what I did the first time I'd made it, it was made with just beeswax. And it, it turned out okay, but it, after a while it became very dry. So. Then I Googled it and ended up with a jojoba oil and a pine resin. And the recipe I'll, put, I'll post in there, but it, it, what you do is you heat it up in a double boiler, heat up the wax with the jojoba oil and the pine resin, and it, it becomes a, 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 um, a liquid. Right. Then, can you so, so, slow down just a bit? Could you go back and tell us? what a double boiler is so sure. for the people watching that they understand what you're using to do that because and i know say well she's grabbing that 
Um, she's made a few, and I've been the wonderful recipient of a couple of hers as well. So thank you again, Rosalind. And I'm really excited for her to demonstrate how she does the pouch. But these are wonderful, as you can see, um, to be able to use regularly. And I know she's going to speak to that, but um, yesterday we were at a market and there was a woman next to the booth that actually Scott's here from Scott's Kitchen. And she had all kinds of different sizes and shapes and different applications of them. So um, this one is interesting, Roz, because I've used it on a round dish a lot. So you're starting to see a little bit of the round piece in there. So I'll, I'll throw it over to you to show a little bit more of the uses. But I, I have to say, um, they've really changed the way that I can serve food and put food in and have saved me a lot of money in extra plastic wraps and things. But you need to help me make a pouch. So back over to you. So what's nice about it is, is you use it in place of saran wrap. So the plastic wrap. So it's, it's great for um, storing your cheese. Uh, don't, you don't use meat in it, but vegetables or anything like that. So a double boiler is typically water on the bottom and a pot on the top that, that it's, the water boils and you keep it so that it stays dry on the top, but it gives you a, a liquid form. So that's one way of doing it. The other way I did it was I put it in the oven at 300 degrees. So I put it in wax, um, you grate it on the cloth and you put it between two pieces of parchment paper so the wax doesn't disappear anywhere and it stays on the cloth itself. Now th to talk about the cloth is when you, when you purchase your cloth, it has to be 100% cotton. So the cotton is what you wash your cloth and then you uh, take the, uh, the wax, the adobo oil and the, and the resin and you brush it on the cloth and then you put it another piece of parchment paper on top and then you put it in the oven at 300 degrees. That's one way of doing it. And it only takes a very short time. It's just to spread the, uh, the resin and so that the cloth absorbs the wax. The first time I did it, and I like it the best, is I use a handy dandy iron. So what's really nice, because you can really control where the wax goes with the iron. So again, you put the, you don't put it in the oven, you put the cloth down, you sprinkle the wax or, or, or paint the, the wax resin on, and then you just spread it around very gently with the iron. So what happens that way is that you end up with a better product because you can spread it and it, you don't lose as much on the wax off, off the paper. So what Michelle was talking about is when I first made these, I have numerous cloths, so you can buy them at Walmart in uh, different sizes. But the first time I bought, I bought, went out and bought some cotton shirts. I washed them and then I made different. They had, um, this, these particular ones had pockets. It was a, it was a, a, a nurse's uniform. So what I did was I kept the pocket, as you can see, and this is what I carry my nuts in at times. So I kept the pocket, I put this, the wax on the inside, and but I, I made a little top so that what happens when you're carrying your nuts, you don't want them to all disappear. So when you fold it over like this, it's like a pocket. And then you just hold it like this and it seals. So I can carry my nuts, I can carry fruit in it, and it doesn't fall out. So that's what I did with my pockets. Um, the other thing I did was there were some sleeves, of course, in that shirt. So instead of throwing the sleeves away, I made a sleeve. So I put my broccoli or my cauliflower in there. Again, I seal it. And then I have, so I basically have a sleeve that I can put big vegetables in, um, Brussels, anything. You can store anything in it. And again, you seal it. So the vegetables stay fresh in your fridge. So that's what I do there. So, and then this particular one is like, again, the same thing. You can wrap your cheese in it. You can wrap, um, I use, uh, if I have a red pepper or whatever I want, I wrap my vegetables in it. And again, the same thing is when you, when you store your, your um, vegetables or leftovers and you can't find the lid, you just put the wax wrap on it and you heat up your hand seals the top of the wrap. And what happens then in that case is you put it in the fridge and then when you take it out, it's very easy to come off. So that's what I do. And I, uh, 
I enjoy making them. I make them for Christmas presents typically and pass them on to friends and family. Uh, I went around and I bought um, honey again today uh, from, whoops, from a, a local beekeeper. He owns a, um, a restaurant here in town called Vito's and he makes really delicious honey. And Michelle was correct. Yeah, Michelle was correct. This particular honey is very liquidy. It's a uh, liquid form. However, when it gets to the bottom, it looks like Michelle's because it's been sitting a very long time because it takes a while to eat this much honey. And my end of my dish is, so towards the end, when my, when my liquid honey sits around for a very long time, it ends up looking like Michelle's, but this is the tail end of my last jar. So it gets very hard, but still delicious and it melts up just perfectly well. Delicious. It's all back to you, Michelle. You know what, Rod? Thank you. And now you see why I wanted her to show us all that pouch. So I'm sitting over here feeling like I'm feeling my pouch following folding thing, but that's a me thing. Roz, these are really amazing. And like I said, they're all in different sizes. I think it's a wonderful at home thing to do. And I can see Jacqueline, who's our resident crafty person, um, hopefully having that as, as a regular piece of it. So really appreciate those shares. Um, we're going to, you know, bread and honey is probably a very, a very Atlantic Canadian piece. So what I'm saying to everybody too, is when you go to a lot of restaurants, you will see honey like maple on a lot of different restaurants and applications. And the other thing that's really wonderful, you'll often see where the honey is from, because we do really honor the beekeepers and the individuals that are making this. It's a special craft. It's not something everybody wants to do. So a big shout out to Ron and our beekeepers there. So we're going to talk to Maureen a bit about what uh, she's going to briefly just tell us a little bit about her bread and honey. And I do believe, and I know that she's a bit of a baker. And then Ron, Richard's got a little bit of a video to kind of show up what's going on with the bees. But I'll say this about Atlantic Canada. And growing up, my grandfather, my dad, dad liked to make breads. And oftentimes they would substitute the sugar in the bread recipe for honey. So you'll see a lot of honey breads. And that is extremely common in bakeries and different places around. And I think it became a very traditional piece. So Maureen, we'll get you to make sure that you're unmuted. You look perfect, by the way. We, like I love, we can see all the things. So let's get you unmuted so you can share the bread and honey because it is so traditional in growing up. I think your parents would be the same thing. They just get out a piece of bread and the honey and sometimes that's breakfast. So, oh, hey, Maureen okay. from Liverpool, please share us from Nova Scotia what's going on in your honey world today. Can you hear me, Michelle? Can you hear me? Perfectly. Okay. Uh, first of all, what I'd like to do is um, just talk about the raw honey because that's what I'm using. And, uh, and actually, it's my favorite honey. Uh, I always loved it because it is it's pure white honey. And the reason it's, it's like that is because it's, it is the honey that, that actually comes right out of the beehives. It's, it's not processed in any way. And, and basically the, the liquid honeys are processed. So when you're eating raw honey, you're actually eating 100% pure honey. It hasn't been interfered with in any way. And it still has all the antioxidants in it and all the enzymes that are there that actually help us in many medicinal ways. So um, I'd say for, for, for me, I, this would always be my favorite choice for honey, the creamed honey. And what, I, what I've done is I've, I've uh, baked up this loaf, loaf of bread yesterday. And one of the favorite things that I like to do with um, this type of honey is um, put it on bread. And I, I've actually got the honey on the bread already. I put it on. Can you see that? Um, I'll just... Uh, just give you a, oh, look at that. Isn't it wonderful? That's wonderful. I'm going to put more on here. <laughs> and this, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put it under the grill. And what happens then is that honey seeps through the bread, right? And it's fantastic. So I'm just going to put it in now. So Maureen's really spoiling us, and I really appreciated that piece and on, on the difference with the raw honey aspect of it, which is again why you're not going to see those things. But that's a really good trick about sticking that under the grill to melt it a bit. 
but it really only works well when you have it in that raw honey format. I you can. can you, I'm going to be doing this after Maureen. Okay, good. <laughs> well, just under there, it just has to stay in about two minutes, and maybe not that. Maybe, maybe one minute, and then it's perfect. Um, yes, and then also there, I have some other uh, points about the uh, about the honey because the honey, of course, is used. It's very good for digestive issues as well. So, say if you have a teaspoon of honey at night, if you have a a tummy problem or something that's going to make a, a big difference for you it's just the most it's it's like the magical um kind of uh, of cure for almost everything honey well maureen just to add on to that when we're, and during the research honey's been found in medicinal purposes to be one of the oldest things that was put into teas and different pieces of it and there's often something in atlantic canada you'll hear called a hot toddy which oh. means you put a little bit of a whiskey um, I have this one because it happens to be my mother's favorite type of whiskey. So Richard, an homage to you with the Irish flu shot glass and the other ingredients that you would put into that, Maureen, you keep that handy, is you're going to put that, you're going to put a little bit of lemon <clears throat> and a good amount of honey, warm it up, and that's what they often call a hot toddy for helping your belly. Maureen, show us that again. Ooh. Maureen, Ooh. tell us about it. Yeah. So, so, so anyway, um, Maureen, you need to show us the thing and talk at the same time, please. Okay. Just one second. I've just got honey on my. Okay. Can you see it? Just do what you were doing before. I put it up my camera and talk. Well, you see the honey, the honey is melting onto the, I'll have to hold it here. Can you see it? You got it now, Maureen. Okay. You know, what happened there was uh, the honey had gone through the bottom. It was dripping onto the iPad. <laughs> so you have to be very careful with that. But anyway, um, it's, um, it's a very healthy breakfast and you can have that with your favorite, uh, cup of coffee. Maureen, right. thank you so much for sharing that and the tips from Liverpool, Nova Scotia today. It was absolutely <laughs> perfect. So and we're going to roll back over for time today to, to Ireland. And we've got a couple more recipes before we wrap up in the few minutes that we've got everybody back. But Maureen, if we've got a few tips at the end, did you have something else you wanted to share with us today? Hey, um, to, to rise, I've never seen anything like her pouches. They're brilliant. <laughs> Thank you so much. And you know what? Now I see pouches in all of our futures, Roz. Do you see that happening? Because I certainly do. So Richard, I know that you've got a couple um, of a thing. We're going to talk a little bit of the beekeeper. And you know what's really nice is Maureen referenced the, the, the honey that comes directly out of the hive. That's exactly what would be coming out of these hives. And we're going to be excited when we come up in a future episode to actually open up the hives that we're going to show you and talk a little bit about more about how that looks. But I'm going to get Richard to share a couple of those PowerPoints and tell us about the end of his recipe. And we're going to wrap up with an incredible um, chicken marinade and um, uh, a wonderful honey spicy dip to go with it. So Richard, let's go over to you to show us a few of the things you've got and to wrap up your roasted chicken, which by the way, looked spectacular. And you're on mute. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's, I'd say it's done. Oh, can you hear it? Can you hear it boiling? Yeah, it's almost, yeah, there it is. <laughs> so, so that's going to be good. Um, I'll just push this around and the flavor will go into the bottom part as well. So that's going to be really good. But uh, we had a bit of a PowerPoint put together. Uh, the video, Michelle, I'm sorry, it's going to take another five minutes. And if you asked me to put that in there last night, that would have been in the crackly part of the phone conversation. So I didn't hear that. <laughs> but um, let's go over to um, the PowerPoint anyway, so we can see Michelle's hives as well. Okay. 
So I also this, want uh, you guys to know, I just, just sorry, Richard, I, I did put, oh, go ahead, Richard. Oh, I think we saw this one as well, didn't we? Um, this was on Jacqueline's thing. This is the benefits of honey, you know, insomnia, indigestion, coughs, colds, headaches, fatigue, all kinds of things. It's almost as, as great as tequila, you know. So, <laughs> and uh, these are the, some of the benefits between honey and raw honey. What's the difference? Pollen is a big one for the people that have allergies, um, may contain antibiotics. So this is why we always kind of try to get the, honey, the raw honey stuff, because this has been tampered with, as my mother would say. <laughs> and ever so true. So Richard, while you've got it up there, I want to say anybody who's ever had a paper cut, which I'm sure everybody here is at a paper cut at some point or a little splinter. And, and we'll say, please get back onto the chat box and into our Facebook group and tell us about it. We will post the video, which we did of Ron the Beekeeper, Richard, on, on the Facebook group, so anybody can go see Ron. Um, but if you put a little bit of honey and a Band-Aid on a paper cut within two days, it will no longer sting because bacteria can't live in honey, especially raw honey. Yeah, and also slows the aging process. Look at this. It's good for skin as well, infections, wounds, as Michelle was just saying, sore throats. We all know that. This is the, the life of the honeybee. So we can see that they live in the, the hexagonal houses, um, the hives. So, now this is, um, this is Honey, I'm Home. <laughs> this is Honey, I'm Home. So this is where they live. Now this is, uh, this is the one in Michelle's backyard right now, I think, right, Michelle? Okay, these are some that I saw on an island in Greece, um, Eos. Years ago, I was there looking for a retirement home. <laughs> <laughs> but so they, they come in all kinds of forms and you just have to put them out there and um, you can see the bees and they they're pretty harmless like they just kind of keep to themselves and do their own work um so i'm going to add oh they're good leave that up for a second richard if you guys are going to see the hives that he has in the smaller picture are the ones that are going to be moved to my backyard this coming week so only half of that hive is coming and it's interesting because richard the, the actual the pictures you'll see there's normally only two boxes do you see that in the pictures you have the most of them have two boxes? So what's going to yeah. be happening is Angela has an extra condominium at her place right now. So that's what they're doing is splitting hers down to more look like the ones that you were seeing when you were in Greece. So isn't that interesting? Wow, cool. Yeah, that's um, that sort of takes us to the end there. Uh, the video, I am downloading it at the moment, but I think I still need it. Five more minutes on that. That's okay, so. Richard. I really appreciate that. We will share that out on the on the on the Facebook group. It's only about a minute long, and it and it, and it kind of reiterates just what Ron was talking about about how to treat the bees in your yards. So let's wrap up with a couple. If, if anybody's got any other questions, though, I'm, I'm trying to. Uh, is the raw the same as unpasteurized? Yes. So you know, and oftentimes, like from a cooking, yes. So one step is heated up. Um, like anything, we will use a lot of words to, to say the same thing. Wonderful thing about the English language. So do make sure when you're buying your products that you are reading the labels to make sure that you know where the different pieces are. Um, the minute something's pasteurized, you're gonna, you're gonna change the processing of it. So here's what the chicken fingers. So what I did is I took, just for this recipe, I'm gonna show you guys, the amount that I gave you is I took four chicken breasts and then I cut them into strips. So, and these were marinating since last night. And this mixture has a lot of honey in it. So albeit it looks innocent mm -hmm. like a normal marinade. So mom's gonna sear these off. Hey, let me bring that over here. Okay. So she's gonna sear those off. And kind of like the demo chicken that I did early, you're gonna see how dark that's gonna get quickly because the sugar in the honey will caramelize when it hits the heat. <laughs> so when you're making any type of a marinade, looks beautiful, Richard, and you're using that, do you remember your, your you know, heat's gonna act with your honey. So we always say to make sure that you're watching that and keeping your peat at a pot at a hot pan or a hot heat. So number one cooking tip, like anytime you're searing meat, Never put it in a cold pan. 
Okay. Never put your meat in a cold pan. You will mess up with your cooking time and you will ruin it pretty much. Not really ruin it, but you're not going to get your best optimum cooking time because what happens is the pan's trying to heat up at the same time the meat's trying to heat up and you're going to cook the outside of your meat faster in the wrong way than your inside. Put it on a hot pan, it's going to sear the outside of your meat and have a more even cooking time. So and especially in a recipe like this, it's really important because if not, the honey is going to caramelize and crystallize too fast. And if you've ever done it, it's going to be stuck to the pan and you can't flip it. <laughs> and I'm smiling at anybody who said it. it's like, that's what happened. It's chemistry. It's really not, it might be a chefy thing, but it really starts to come down to chemistry at that point. So the marinade in it had maple syrup. It had the grainy mustard. Take a over into that. And I'm going to put this on there. I used a really good maple or maple garlic powder, about a tablespoon of a garlic powder. And I've got a nice, those nice dried onion plates from these ones I get from Urban Joy. So it's a toasted onion. I know this is all organic onion, which is really great because I know it's onions that she grew. Those are all in the marinade and, and they've been sitting in that overnight. So the acid a bit from the mustard too helps really give it the different piece. So while those are coming out, everybody needs a dip if you're making a chicken finger. And those are looking perfect. So these chicken, oh, there's one other ingredient. I can't believe I forgot about it. Turmeric. Oh, yes. So I put turmeric. turmeric in my marinade for my chicken and I do that a lot. Why? Turmeric is really, really good for you from a health standpoint as well. Kind of pretty though, adds some nice flavor to it. It does a, a color, I should say. It doesn't have a ton of flavor, but it has a ton of health benefits and something that we really do recommend that is in there. And it's a, it's a big ingredient that I cook with on a regular basis. So that's the other piece. So not that they weren't orange enough or other flavors. I want a dip and honey is a wonderful thing to use for dips. And I know that um, in a lot of flavors, you'll have a honey garlic or a honey this. So I've used some of the hickory buffalo sauce that I've got from Scott's Kitchen. So those beautiful flavors. But this particular one, I, want, I wanted to use a hickory. What I'm also now adding to it is, so I've got a quarter of a cup of the buffalo sauce and I'm putting about two tablespoons of the honey in it. And there's one other ingredient. This looks so perfect, Mom that I'm going to put into the sauce. And that's a tiny bit of Dijon mustard. So what I've done is made a honey dip using the buffalo sauce that's already got that spice and, and it's got the hickory flavoring in it to it. So that's actually quite lovely to add, but I didn't want it to be so hot. So the honey cools it down and then the Dijon mustard gives it a tiny bit of acid. So I will tell you, it's got a beautiful orange color and it smells delicious. I did you a taste test earlier and look at this. Come here, mom. Perfectly cooked chicken fingers. Look at those. Way to go, Helen. But can you see the browning on them? And I want everybody to be able to see that. That's the caramelization that's going to come out of the honey in the pan. I also want to say how, how the the caramelization of these, as you're going to see here, you see how thin they're cut? I want to really make that a really good point. Why? Because if you cut them too thick, you're going to have to cook them longer and you're more likely to overcook them. So I really want everybody to be seeing this. So I'm going to dip one in the sauce, which I think is going to look great. And look how pretty that looks. And you see why it's extra sticky too? Because there's the honey dripping off it. So, oh yeah. Those flavors pair really well together. Just enough spice, but the sweet, you get the honey off both sides of it. Because remember, it's in the marinade and it's in the dip. So there's your spicy chicken, your mom. I'll hand her over the other side. The other thing that's really fantastic about honey is it's a little bit of a sticky situation, isn't it, everybody? Afterwards, the other tip I'll also give is when you're putting all of your items away, 
take the extra time with a wet cloth to make sure you wipe everything down. As I've got about six honey jars open right now and I've got stickiness all over my counter. So if there's any other questions, please let us know. But I hope from our kitchens to yours, there's a few extra honey treats that I put on my thing. One of the favorite cereals, honey bunches of oats. I think what you're gonna see is again, honey is one of those most universal pieces. We hope that you've taken some of our Atlantic Canadian inspired dishes and how that we use it. The shirt I've got on today is called A Route to Elma. And it's up to 114, which happens to be the street that I live right off of. So our beekeeper Ron, he takes care of bees that are in different farms and different things all the way up to 114. So I'm really excited to add, add him to our equation. But we've got Angela at Urban Joy and Funny Farms Fresh Local Harvest was down visiting their greenhouses this week. Roslyn will be with me down the following week. But you'll see right here on my shirt, Turks and Moncton and Riverview. I'm partway, which is where Roslyn is. We move partway down in the middle and that's where we're starting to see all the honey is harvested and it goes directly down the 114. So you can see just how close that is here in Albert County. And I'll tell you the same beautiful journey exists from Halifax into Lunenburg and the entire South Shore of Nova Scotia, which is consistently celebrating fresh local producers. And as I said, I was very proud to say that some of our honey today is airing in from Nova Scotia. So you'll see those products readily available. And one of the best places in the world to get honey is Prince Edward Island. And Prince Edward Island, which we're gonna be featuring more products from there because PEI potatoes is a really big deal as well. But these are a honey lozenge that is made by a company here in Prince Edward Island. These are shipped across North America and all over the world. And again, and it's a honey and it's got a 97% real honey in it, which is wonderful to see. And they're made with echinacea, zinc, and vitamin C, and it's an immune booster. So extremely proud of our Atlantic Canadian um, producers that are getting their products that are shipped all over the world and recognizing and seeing how this wonderful product is available for everybody. So what do we say from our kitchens mm -hmm. to yours? Thank you so much for joining us on Atlantic Canada Cooks. We really appreciate our guests and our guest cooks from around the world. And we're gonna look forward to enjoying our sticky, spicy, rest of our piece. And yes, mom and I did finish eating off all of those scallops when you all were cooking and not looking. <laughs> so um, thank you wait, everybody. Wait, 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 wait. And what are you, sorry, Richard, go ahead. One of the things that uh, I don't think we mentioned, but I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody knows, but is when you're, when you're getting these honey, you know, the tablets like you had, like the health boosters, if they're local, that helps you with your local immunity, you know, cause you want to make sure that the honey if you're living in Ireland, you want to make sure it's Irish honey because that's going to help you with, you know, the, the pollen in the air of Ireland. Uh, same with over there. So PEI is local to New Brunswick. And that's so you don't want to have Asian honey in Canada. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, you know, it's really fun, Richard. I love that you've added that because when we, we were talking, a lot of people realize that we get together. We spend time each week talking about what we're going to do, what's going to go on, the health benefits of it. And really, really proud to say that. And eating in season is an extremely important thing. And I can tell you that it's something that mom and I do consistently. Um, I know Roslyn is extremely consistent, but we hope that what we teach everybody, and especially as this coming harvest season is, is eating in season is what our bodies were intended to do. And to Richard's point, things that are produced in your area and things that are growing at that particular time, that's actually how God intended and that's how our bodies were intended to be receiving food. So if carrots are plentiful or rhubarb, which is coming up all in Rosalind's backyard is plentiful. That actually means it's nature's way to reminding every one of us that's the bounty of coming out. So we're gonna enjoy this entire journey the rest of this year and making sure all of you understand what's readily available in Atlantic Canada What's on the restaurants? Because I could tell you, there's a restaurant called Close, C L L O S, um, and they were absolutely incredible. And it's owned by some local individuals here. They've got a couple of other Houston Park um, beer halls and places to go. But I can tell you, their menu was spectacular. There was international chefs from around the world cooking there, and it was a food journey. And they're very focused on in-season cooking. So we'll continue to bring all of the in-season cooking. I hope soon that we'll get the herbs de Provence de New Brunswick shipped out to everybody. 
and um, we'll be excited to putting a taste of our kitchen to yours. And uh, soon we'll see some of you in Canada. So thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you. Have it's a, a beautiful time. day here. Please go enjoy yours. No, don't forget not to mow the lawn, mom. <laughs> no problem. <laughs>